Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to yet another interesting conversation as a part of the Wit Talk series. My name is Jaskiran, and I'll be your host this afternoon. In the last two years, if I have learned anything, uh, it's two things. One is that um, the world is constantly changing, and the only way to survive it uh, is, and I can literally survive it, is uh, if you keep on innovating. And um, this innovation has probably changed. Uh, not only the way that we work, the way that we operate, but the way that we think. Uh, everything around us depends upon our agility to be able to catch that change and make it work in our favor. So this afternoon, what we're going to do is combine these two topics, innovation and the future of work, and have uh, an insight by one of the uh, you know uh, leading leaders in corporate India to understand how uh, you know innovation skills can be used for changing the future of work. So without uh, much ado, let me introduce you to the uh, uh, my my guest this afternoon. His name is Rizwan. Rizwan is the co-founder and CEO of Citius Tech since 2005. As the as the CEO, Rizwan drives Citius Tech's worldwide business strategy, including healthcare technology, innovation, and healthcare domain expertise development. Under his leadership, Citius Tech has become one of the fastest growing healthcare technology solutions providers, serving more than 60 leading healthcare organizations worldwide. Before Citius Tech, he was the CEO and founder of Transwork, now Aditya Birla Binax, a leading BPO with over 15,000 employees today. Earlier, he was also the senior consultant with McKinsey and Company. Rizwan received IIT Bombay's Distinguished Alumni Award in 2019. Rizwan won the EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2013 and Young Achievers Award for Business in 2002 by the Indo-American Society. He has a master's degree from MIT and a bachelor's degree from engineering in from IIT. Welcome, Rizwan. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, um, Rizwan, such diverse uh, experience and you know, right from being a consultant to being an entrepreneur to you know, working in the healthcare uh, industry. You know, how what what guided you? How have you been able to manage to connect the dots? So, um, you know, let me uh, step back here. And uh, if I look back at uh, my journey uh, since I, I was probably in my early 20s over the last 30 years. Uh, I would say that there have been four points of inflection in my career. Uh, first, as a graduate student, uh, I, I was in Boston. And at that point, I had a choice to come back to India or continue to be a, a uh, you know, seek employment opportunities. This was in the early 90s when it wasn't very common to have, uh, a, you know, someone come back to India. And uh, I made a decision, uh, partly professional, partly personal, to come back to India. And uh, that was sort of one point of inflection. And that uh, worked out very well for me. Uh, I then ended up spending five years with a firm, a McKinsey and Company. You mentioned that, just Kiran. And uh, having uh, done really well as a senior consultant at McKinsey, which uh, you know was one of the top uh, choices uh, for any uh, professional uh, in India and actually worldwide. Uh, it's a very well-known firm. Uh, I had a choice of uh, either continuing uh, my career as a consultant or being an entrepreneur. And uh, for a variety of reasons, I felt that, you know, being an entrepreneur at that time would be a good idea. So I quit uh, a really sort of flourishing role at McKinsey to be an entrepreneur. So that was sort of the second point of inflection uh, in my career. And then uh, once we started the BPO firm Transworks, about four years after that, we had a choice to either continue or sell the business. And again, that was a point of inflection and uh, we decided to sell the business. Uh, and uh, fortunately that created more opportunities because uh, uh, the very next year in 2005, uh, we started uh, Citius Tech. And I've been running the company uh, for about 16 years now. And uh, two years back, uh, you know, I felt that now I'd uh, you know, done the same job for 16 years, terribly exciting job, but I'd still run it for 16 years. And I should do something more in the social impact space. Uh, so I spoke to uh, our uh, our shareholders and all of us, and we decided that uh, we will bring on new leadership in the company. And as chance would have it, uh, this is my last week in my role as chief executive. And from next week onwards, I'll continue to be a board member and an important shareholder in City Estate. But I want to uh, start uh, 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 spending more time in the philanthropy and the not-for-profit space. Uh, my plans are still in the works, but uh, it is clearly a point of inflection for me. So each time in my career, uh, you know, I have had uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, do something new, 
then I have, uh, uh, as long as I had the conviction to do it, I have uh, jumped into it. And, uh, you know, fortunately for me, uh, uh, they have turned out quite nicely. So uh, that's sort of in a, in a nutshell, uh, you know, of what, uh, you know, has been my journey so far. So pass it back to you, uh, Jessica. Ma'am. This one, a lot of us get very scared, you know, the moment that we have a choice, we don't know whether we should go, you know, one way or the other. You know, what, what, uh, uh, what skills, if I may call it a skill, or what thought process do we go through when deciding whether this path that you think you may take to, to get to the next step of success was going to work? Because a lot of women in the audience, I'm sure, keep thinking about, should I go there? Should I not go there? Will it work? Will it not work? So what, was, what guided you to make that change and take that step? understand. So, you know, human beings are amazing creatures. We can take a really good idea and if we, we uh, think very hard about it for a long time, then we can find enough reasons not to do it and convince ourselves it's not a good idea. And then there are things that, you know, are completely outrageous that we put our heart to it. And even if they're not uh, possible to do, we somehow find a way to do it. So I would just say that, uh, you know, beyond a certain point, uh, there is a certain logic uh, to uh, doing things. But as long as you have a uh, deep faith and conviction in what you want to do, then don't think too much. Uh, just start working towards it. And uh, if you are diligent about, uh, you know, I often joke with people, if you're diligent about having a goal that you can articulate in, a, in one or two lines, and if you can make an action plan or a to-do list every day and stick by it, then you'll eventually get to your path. Yeah. I think I, I agree. Having a goal and actually standing by what you believe in is, is a critical thing for you to be able to achieve the success. Um, you know, talking about success, a lot of articles are being written nowadays about how technology is going to change the way the uh, job market is. Some of the jobs will become redundant. And uh, you know, the Brookings Institute also wrote that uh, robots and artificial intelligence and driverless cars are no longer a thing in the distant future. I also read an article where uh, an AI uh, bot has been given uh, citizenship of, of a nation and being treated like a regular citizen. So, you know, what do you think uh, will be the balance uh, that needs to be there between technological investment and people management in the future? So uh, it's an interesting question at an interesting time. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the world, uh, uh, especially in the post-COVID world, what you'll find is just an amazing focus on using technology in all businesses. You know, it could be uh, entertainment, it could be uh, manufacturing, it could be healthcare, it could be in pretty much every sector. We find that uh, companies uh, who were uh, doing uh, their business suddenly figured out that if they don't truly embrace technology and uh, the word digital transformation gets uh, very commonly used these days. So if they don't undertake a digital transformation of their business and they are not able to uh, 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 communicate and uh, interact with their customers, their business partners, their vendors in a more digital fashion, uh, then uh, sooner rather than later, they will lose their competitiveness and they will uh, perhaps go out of business. And therefore, worldwide, uh, if you are a bank or you are a manufacturing company or you are a hospital or, or whichever industry you are in, uh, uh, organizations have doubled down on their technology investments. And uh, more and more organizations and uh, CEOs and leaders are looking and basically asking a simple question, how do we use technology better to become more efficient? Now, having said that, uh, every piece of technology that gets built, that gets maintained, need people around uh, with the right set of uh, skills and uh, capabilities. So a uh, massive investment in technology is possible only with a massive investment in uh, people who understand the business of technology. So I think they both go hand in hand. And uh, I feel that uh, certainly the audience that uh, VTS is uh, engaging with, you know, they are all, they are all women who do have an inclination for technology or do understand technology well. And I would say for the next 15, 20 years, uh, uh, which is probably for the most part, the career uh, span that uh, most of us uh, will be worried about, uh, there is a huge opportunity to be able to build a career in technology. So uh, very exciting times for, uh, individuals who understand the business of technology. The, you know, not all jobs require a direct uh, technology, uh, you know, or a, or a coding or a act, actual technical nature, are actually technical in nature. You know, what about the jobs that are 
people have in probably HR or marketing or, you know, or finance, how is technology shaping those job roles, you know, and how, what can, uh, you know, we do to ensure that we don't uh, feel either a left out or probably figure out that, you know, we've kind of been left behind because our understanding of technology is very different than how, you know, uh, the, 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 the tech gurus understand it understand so I, I think that's a that's a great point uh, I, my previous answer was more focused around uh, uh, individuals who are going to be in the business of technology but even if you look across the board and I will just use Citius Tech as a, a good example of that and what is true about Citius Tech is true about thousands of other organizations so a post uh, when COVID hit us last year uh, like uh, all organizations we had to also uh, very quickly activate a uh, a strategy for getting everybody in the organization to work from home and as a technology company we build a lot of software we uh, we support a lot of our clients globally on their technology needs and all of that so that part of the work clearly went uh, and started happening from uh, individual homes if you look at the core business of the company which includes uh, my human resource team my human resource team suddenly had to revamp their uh, approach from being a very hands-on, you know, we need to be on the floor, we need to be interacting with people uh, to uh, coming up with strategies of how they're going to engage with everyone in an online mode. Uh, it is interesting that uh, we uh, do extensive surveys of uh, individuals in our organizations, internal surveys as well as external surveys through an organization called The Great Place to Work and what we found that a year after COVID, when we did the surveys, uh, the ability to maintain that human connect uh, and be able to engage with employees earned us a higher employee satisfaction score uh, in 2020 than we had ever had before. So my human resources team not only changed the way they were working, but they actually excelled at it, where uh, you know individuals of the company who were working from home ended up feeling much more comfortable about uh, the uh, engagement uh, within their teams as well as with the human resource team. Uh, if I look at other functions like recruitment, uh, the recruitment used to be a massive uh, a lo logistical exercise in the industry where you know you had to literally ferry hundreds of individuals uh, on weekdays, weekends to your offices and manage them uh, in very large numbers. Now the entire recruitment process happens online. And not only has it improved the quality of interviewing that we are doing because uh, you know we are able to manage the process more efficiently but we are able to now hire a much more diverse set of uh, individuals from different parts of the country than we were able to do before so for example earlier uh, for many years uh, we did not have a center in pune and uh, the reason we didn't have a center in pune is because every new location it takes a lot of time to build up the base volume of uh, individuals to make that center viable. So, for example, if there is a center with only, uh, you know, 20, 50 individuals, it becomes really hard to have a center because uh, we need to get to 500,000 uh, professionals before having a location, a net new location becomes viable. Interestingly, what COVID did was that as uh, we do a lot of hiring from Mumbai, Bangalore uh, and other locations, my recruitment team started recruiting in Pune. Uh, in uh, the middle of 2020 and in the last 12 months we have hired uh, 600 to 700 professionals in Pune without actually having a center in Pune uh, because of COVID. Uh, nobody wanted to come to our center to you know meet uh, people etc because it was happening online. Now when COVID will recede uh, we are already signed up a facility in Pune because now we have the critical mass uh, so we were able to get out of this chicken and egg problem of having a center in Pune and COVID enabled us to do that. Yeah. If I look at my sales organization, uh, for the very long time, we used to believe that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which industry you are in, but sales is a very in-person. So we would have sales teams fly all over the world to meet clients and prospective clients to sell. Now the entire sales process has got optimized uh, for, uh, for City Tech, where everything is happening online. We have closed more new clients in the last 12 months than we did in any year pre-COVID. And it is quite fascinating for me that, you know, we've been able to close clients that nobody at Citius Tech has ever met. And these are multi-million dollar relationships and, uh, uh, you know, opportunities that we're talking about. 
And the very simple reason for that is because even buyers have become very comfortable trusting uh, information, trusting people online. And the need for everybody to show up has actually come down. Now, all these create fascinating opportunities for women who are uh, either desirous of coming back to the workplace or women who want more flexible. And I can talk more about that, uh, you know, just then. But uh, this is sort of some examples of how even outside of just technology, whether you're in sales, you're in recruitment, you're in human resources, you're in training, uh, COVID and remote working has fundamentally changed uh, how we are able to do our jobs. Yeah. I completely agree. I think, you know, uh, a lot of things, uh, even though we keep uh, cribbing about uh, COVID and how it has impacted us negatively, but we have learned a lot of new things and, and things have actually in, 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 uh, improved for the better in some of the ways that we used to work traditionally. Um, there is a question in the audience which is kind of linked to what we're talking about, uh, uh, Nisman. It says, what skills will be key in future to stay relevant in, uh, in the future where AI and technological advancements can put people out of workforce? So any specific skills that you feel we need to focus on? So, um, you know, I would, I would tell individuals that uh, there are lots of opportunities to do what uh, can be done without really worrying about uh, the impact of, you know, AI and stuff like that uh, right now. Um, eventually, if you look at it from a very long term perspective, will a lot more things get automated? The answer is yes. But I would say in the near term and uh, in the near to midterm, which is the next five, seven years, uh, there are lots of areas where uh, uh, traditional jobs, uh, you know, you could be a finance professional, you could be an HR professional, you could be a technology person. Uh, I just think that if you're good in one thing, then today the job market in India is so hot and that you will have no problem finding a job. So I wouldn't worry about uh, whether long term what will happen to, you know, sort of our careers and what will be the impact of AI and all of that. I would just take a much more practical view of saying, what am I really good at? And can I hone my skills in that area? And can I get a job for myself? And then once I have a job, then I will make sure that there is continuous learning happening uh, where as I become more senior in my career, I am able to invest uh, more time in learning. I'm not going to be static. So I'm it's not, I was an accountant and I learned something in my undergrad in account. So I'm not going to just sit there, uh, you know, and do my accounting job. But I've got an accounting job. I'm doing well there. I'm going to continuously hone what are the new skills I need to do to become even a better accountant or a better technology professional along the way. And I can tell you for sure that if, as long as you have a learning mindset and you are committed to spending time on uh, gradually along with your job, upgrading your skills, you won't have to worry. Maybe maybe our kids will have to worry about this question a little bit more than we would. But right now, I think it's uh, more hype uh, than what is happening on the ground. Uh, I think uh, I, I would, uh, especially if I didn't have a job, I would not worry about how AI will take away my future job. I would just worry about getting a job today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. And, you know, I think it's about for our kids need to worry about what they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm very comfortable yeah. doing what I do. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think I think we we, we got saved by one generation. In <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, you did mention, Rizwan, about the opportunities that, you know, uh, women have got in post-COVID uh, times, you know. Um, any, do you want to dwell more on that? You know, are there new opportunities, especially in the IT sector, uh, especially with the fact that, you know, you can work remotely from anywhere and still be as productive or or, yeah. or as acknowledged as uh, you were in your traditional times? So I, I think COVID and what has happened to the workforce, especially in technology, has uh, uh, just changed things dramatically. And especially for women uh, who need a little bit more flexibility in their uh uh, in their work hours and the way they approach their jobs so let me give you a few examples okay uh, prior to covid uh, the industry worked in a very straight jacketed way what exactly do i mean right everybody had to follow a certain script everybody had to show up to work for nine hours everybody was expected to come to work maybe some organizations had a little bit of a work from home policy which gave some little bit of flexibility what COVID has taught organizations is how to work in a remote environment and do it at scale. Uh, you know, tens of there are companies with hundreds of thousands of employees working remotely and they are doing just fine. 
okay so it's taught organizations that you don't need to huddle everybody together in one space for them to be effective as long as you have the right collaboration tools then teams can be effective working in a distributed environment second thing what has happened because you are not ferrying everybody to your office you don't need to worry about timing of people. So, for example, imagine somebody wanted to start work at 7 o'clock in the morning and wanted to finish by 11 and then do four hours later. In the traditional way of doing things, it would be very hard for me to accommodate that because, you know, I don't have my cafeteria, I don't have air conditioning set up, I don't have my IT staff present, right? So, everybody had to follow a certain common drill just because the organization can needs to have certain operating hours and, and, and whether it's IT, security, infrastructure, air conditioning, whatever, right? What now is possible is the ability for organizations to extend flexibility to employees as long as the work is getting done. And that flexibility is possible because organizations have learned how to work in a collaborative manner. So that I think is, is really, really helpful. The next thing what has happened is that there has been such a huge demand supply gap that imagine there was no demand supply gap and we had a lot of technology professionals ch chasing few jobs. Then even today, companies would say, no, I really want a person with X, Y, Z, Z skills. I want only full time employees. I don't. But today, the market demand for talent has become so acute that imagine there was a, a, a woman and she was good in her job. And she could only work six hours a day. And she was a good developer, for example, right? She will get a job like instantly, you know, in, in, and because there'll be lots of organizations who would say, hey, I'm finding it difficult to find anybody. And here I have a very talented professional, but she's only able to work six hours a day. So I'm going to provide that flexibility to that individual. Now, these kinds of things would have been very difficult to do. So whether it's part time, whether it's flexi hours, whether it is work from home, those are amazing opportunities that have got created, which work in the favor of women in the workforce. And, uh, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, uh, I was just looking at our own internal statistics. And uh, what is true in India today, that while lots of metrics in India uh, have done very well in the last 10 years, uh, you know, country has become richer, you know, we are producing more number of cars, we are creating more jobs, etc. But the participation of women in the workforce actually come down quite significantly, you know, which, which is, which is uh, very sad that uh, I think if the government statistics uh, are right, then from a 35% uh, levels of women participation in the work, workforce about 15 years back, uh, it's closer to 25% now, which is a huge drop. And I do believe that COVID provides an amazing opportunity for a lot of women to be able to get back into the work, workplace, get fantastic opportunities. Uh, get compensated uh, very well for the role that they are playing and uh, and be able to marry that with their personal commitments in a manner that was very hard to do in the pre-COVID world there. So back to I you, think, just... I think, I think uh, you know, a number of times when we do, uh, when we work with women groups to understand, you know, why is that, that the numbers are dropping, especially in the mid-level, and we get to hear that every time they hit a crossroad in life, they're getting married or having a child. For them, it's like striking the right balance. And unfortunately, you know, your career kind of starts to take a back seat. But uh, this new entire setup has given them the flexibility, like you said, to be able to work at their own pace and their own time without having to kind of think it's either this or that. It is now becoming an and equation. So I think yeah. uh, things are going to, going, to, going to change there. A linked question is what I see from the audience. It says, how can AI be used to increase the participation of underrepresented groups? And it could probably be like, you know, how do you, uh, you know, kind of, can you use AI to uh, help build diversity at workplace? So am I allowed to say I don't know the answer to the question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there are lots of other questions. I really don't have an intelligent answer to add to this. So I'm going to pass this question. Yeah. yeah. I think it's all about innovation. I'm sure one of these days yeah, you're yeah. going to come no, up with an answer. But I just think, you know. I actually wanted to spend a little bit of time, if you want, uh, are comfortable, you know, just be talking about how should women who have been out of the workforce for a few years, right, think about getting back, right? Yeah. And uh, that, uh, because, you know, often what happens is at the macro level, everything looks great, right? Everybody feels, hey, there are lots of opportunities. But if somebody has been out of a job for three, four, five years, there is a significant amount of... Uh, you know, mental resistance, uh, the significant amount of, uh, I, I would say, 
you know, in some cases, maybe even a lack of confidence that can I really come back to the workforce? Can I really get started, right? And and uh, if that is indeed the bottleneck or that is the hurdle that you need to kind of cross as an at an individual level, uh, my my recommendation to you guys is as follows: that you know, technology obviously is very vast. You know, if somebody has worked in technology for a few years, has taken a few years of break. Uh, trying to get back into quote unquote technology itself may look very challenging. But what is happening right now is because of the modularization of technology, depending on what you history or what background you have, you may be able to pick up some very specific skills in certain areas. So, for example, uh, you are a developer, right? And you may say, you know what, I'm just going to get myself certified on the AWS cloud stack. You know, then what it does, it kind of gives you a very clear line of sight to what you need to achieve. You don't have to become a better developer because that could be a very hard question, but getting yourself AWS certified may be a very tangible real goal that you can achieve, say in six months or nine months and then get into the labor market or get into the job market, right? If you are, uh, you have done work in, in, uh, in ETL or in analytics and you can say, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find out which are the popular packages so Tableau, for example, is a, a good package for reporting and analytics, right? Then what I'm going to do is for the next three months, six months, I'm going to just get myself certified on a certain platform. You know, I could be uh, somebody who has been a tester, you know, and I'm going to look at, uh, you know, what kind of automation tools are out there and I'm going to get myself, I'm going to learn one automation tool, which is popular and I'm going to get myself certified for that, right? So I would say one important uh, uh, aspect of getting back would be to take, just one skill and just one platform which is popular and just try and get certified and if you have generally selected the right platform which is sort of uh, you know in demand then the fact that you now got certified on that platform will enable you to get a job very easily so yeah, that becomes like a, small goals, it's, having it's small a very goals. simple tangible goal if you say i want to be now i've forgotten a development so how will i become a developer anymore that's a very hard question but to get AWS certified developer is a very, very tangible goal, you know. Uh, so uh, look at uh, simple, tangible goals like that. I think that will be really helpful. The second thing I would say is that, you know, even the process of getting interviewed itself for many people who haven't been interviewed for a long time can be very intimidating. And my only suggestion there would be that you just do the, and again, when I say it, it will sound so obvious. There is just practice, 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 you know, make sure that you, you find a friend who's already, you are a developer. You just got AWS certified. Now you want to start giving interviews. Just just find a couple of friends to do mock interviews, you know, and you can you can get in and you can actually go through that process a few times in different ways. And uh, the moment you've done uh, you know a bunch of these mock interviews, uh, make sure that you've got a, a, a great uh, you know uh, 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 IT setup, your voice, uh, you know backdrop, whatever it is, you know is is all in place. You don't want to be in a situation where you do three, four interviews and you get rejected because then often it can create a little bit of a blow on your uh, self-confidence uh, as you are trying to get back into the industry. So a little bit of prep in a very focused manner and you will be amazed at, at your hit rate in giving interviews and getting getting great job opportunities. Yeah. I think that they're two very uh, valid and uh, doable advices. You know, one is to get small goals get make small goals make milestones make it tangible that you can achieve so you don't feel that you it's a bigger goal that it could take more time and also to practice with friends i think that's the importance of having the networks uh, yeah. in place um what about innovation uh, rizwan you know everybody talks about you know uh, what is next what is next can innovation skills be taught can you learn them if yes you know how so honestly, uh, this, these are again very fuzzy questions to which I find very difficult to give clear answers to. Uh, to me, innovation is something very simple. Okay, you can either make it as a conceptual point, which becomes very hard to answer, or you say that hey, you know, innovation may mean different things to different people. I was a QA person uh, b before I took my three-year break. I want to get back into the market. I'm going to learn this new skill, and I'm going to get a job for myself. Okay. So to me, that is your innovation, that you went out and you selected something which was new for you and you went out and did it, right? If you start the process by saying, I want to learn about what is new in technology, so I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to type what is new in technology. 
then I can tell you that you could be spending 20 years just reading about what the different articles have been written on innovation and technology. The more you read, the more you'll get intimidated. And the more you'll convince yourself, Kare, wo to matlab, innovation bahut bad gaya hai. now I can't, I can't catch up with this anymore. Right? And that is a way uh, for you to uh, somehow get discouraged uh, in, in your quest to learn more. You know? So I often tell people, you, know, you can't go online and say what is innovation or what is new in the world because you get infinite number of answers. And everybody seems to be writing some a very interesting article. And especially if you're without a job for many years, right? I can just imagine uh, somebody reading all this and saying, hey, you know what? The world has moved so far ahead that it is impossible for me to catch up, you know? But the moment you stop doing that and simply say, hey, I just need one job, okay? And I just need one skill to get that one job. So why am I worried about innovation? Why don't I just figure out what is the hot skill that is within striking distance, right? Let me just go and learn that and then let me apply for a great job by practicing a whole bunch of interviews and I'm going to get a job. Then once I get paid 10 lakhs, 15 lakhs a year or whatever else I get paid, then I will, in my free time, I'll go and read about innovation at that point. Yeah. I think you've just kind of demystified innovation for me, you know, realizing what innovation means to me is probably the first step and not getting completely bogged down by what the the world is doing out there. I think that, I think you've yeah, just put it- Because the together. world is doing many things, you know? So if we have to just focus on our own small silo and just do that well, yeah, rather than worry about what is happening in the world. It can be very intimidating to learn about what everybody else is doing. How smart the world is, is a very intimidating uh, thing to learn. Yeah. And I can so relate to it as one, um, uh, you know, I'm a returning woman myself. I had taken a sabbatical, came back into active workforce after a long break. And uh, I can completely understand, you know, it, it feels a little overwhelming once you come back to say, you know, do I still have it? What should I do differently? And then you start getting the confidence. But if you if you know that it is my definition of what I need to do and not be guided by what everybody else is doing, uh, the journey becomes yeah. a little bit much more easier. That okay. is correct. So, uh, um, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, how COVID has changed things, how COVID has made uh, life uh, easier for women. They have more flexibility working now how technology is helping them to, to, you know, to have that flexibility. How does, uh, what, what does the growth of women look like in the healthcare segment now? That's a question from the audience. So, um, so my, my business is more healthcare technology and not healthcare. Okay. So, uh, let me, let me, uh, uh, obviously healthcare itself is a very large, uh, market for, and, and it's, uh, in general worldwide, worldwide, it is a very growing market. You know, uh, so it, it, the, some of the largest growth uh, opportunities of jobs in the world, if you look at it, uh, any country, you'll find healthcare jobs in general. You know, uh, you can be a nurse, you can be a te technician, you can be a doctor, you can be a staff in a, in a hospital. Uh, huge opportunities because, uh, you know, the world needs more healthcare staff. Okay. Now, the part uh, of the healthcare ecosystem that I understand well is, uh, is the technology aspects of healthcare. And even there, uh, there is a massive amount of growth opportunity, massive innovation, uh, which is uh, reflected in, in our uh, business. It's reflected in our strategy. And uh, whether it's uh, in US, whether it's Europe, whether it's in India, uh, there is going to be a massive, uh, the, or there is already a massive investment in upgrading uh, a technology in healthcare. Uh, so, uh, you know, you should expect lots of job opportunities in healthcare. So if any of y'all are interested in pursuing, uh, for example, becoming good, not, not only in technology, but in healthcare technology, then uh, obviously I, I have a very strong vested interest in encouraging you to, you know, look at Sirius Tech as an organization because uh, we are doing really well as a company. You know, in the last two quarters, uh, in, in this year, we'll grow by 50% as an organization. Uh, so uh, we are close to 6,000 professionals. And uh, every year uh, we are growing very, very rapidly. We are uh, hiring people across uh, not just our traditional areas like uh, Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, but now Pune, but we are hiring across the country. So if anybody is like terribly interested in really learning more, then you should go to our website and uh, you, you should definitely feel free to apply. Uh, we do have uh, special programs to encourage, uh, you know, women who are returning back or even women in general. Uh, so our uh, women ratios tend to be very healthy compared to our uh, technology peers in the market. 
and uh, you know we have a very sort of uh, set of specific programs targeted particularly at women uh, which make it uh, uh, more flexible for them to come in but in general a uh, huge opportunity in 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 the area of healthcare technology even if you look at india for example uh, uh, you all would know that uh, uh, the kind of investments that the government of india is making in upgrading the healthcare technology infrastructure is uh, very significant so uh, we are all familiar with the aadhar card uh, the aadhar number has made such an important difference to financial services market and e-commerce and so many other industries in india uh, including you know government programs uh, are based on the aadhar program in the same way in india the government is rolling out a, a digital health id for all profession uh, all individuals in india and uh, it may not appear like that but 5 years from today uh, you know everybody will be using their digital health ids very actively and that is going to make a very profound difference in the way healthcare in india and technology in healthcare in india is going to evolve as well so even within india lots of exciting opportunities are, ha- are starting to happen in the area of digital health there yeah. um jyoti from the audience wants to know what are the biggest challenges digital health uh, adoption in india are so um the digital health adoption in in, in anywhere in the world right uh, there are many challenges uh, the many challenges historically have been that uh, you know number one uh, uh, doctors and uh, healthcare professionals uh, uh, for them uh, using new tools is often very difficult because uh, uh, you know they are used to working and they're used to practicing healthcare in a certain style now if everything they need to do they need to put into a computer or access from a computer you know there is a little bit of a, a change management or learning unlearning uh, that needs to happen with doctors so that is one of the challenges other challenges in healthcare and digital health tends to be that uh, like financial services even healthcare data is uh, is very sensitive and uh, uh, you know the security and privacy of the data and managing that uh, become very important Uh, all this needs money and for a poor country like india making investments in technology is often difficult but what is exciting so that is all the all the sort of uh, sort of what are you know some of the challenges but if you look on the flip side the lots of interesting things that are happening in india like uh, you know today uh, even uh, poor people have uh, smartphones and uh, the uh, increase uh, in the sale of smartphone is only going up year on year in india so it is quite conceivable that a vast majority of indians including poor indians will have smartphones uh, uh, many of them have today but more and more of them will have in the next 3 to 5 years and what that does is it creates a very unique opportunity for a lot of uh, uh, data uh, sharing a lot of information sharing a lot of care uh, delivery to happen or uh, through the use of the phones and mobile devices which are, are don't then need a lot more investment and so on and so forth so i think there are a lot of exciting things happening as well uh, but uh, uh, you know historically uh, healthcare has been uh, a slow in adoption of technology uh, compared to uh, many other sectors yeah. and that depending on how you see it is a bad news or good news i always think of it as a fantastic news because uh, the fact that healthcare is behind uh, it creates so many more opportunities if uh, healthcare was already fully dig- digitized and everything was happening online then uh, the opportunities would also n- incrementally not be as exciting so uh, very exciting times for healthcare technology it's just a change in perspective i agree uh, another question uh, is from shubhra and she wants to know what do you think is the future of gig economy especially when it comes to women so a lot of what i said earlier was the gig economy stuff right the ability to be able to Uh, have uh, you know flexi timings the ability to have uh, you know flexi hours the ability to be able to uh, you know work from where you want to work so i think the opportunity is just uh, is is phenomenal um tanas wants to know who was your inspiration growing up so honestly uh, i didn't have one particular person as my inspiration but i if if somebody comes closest it would be my mother and uh, she was my inspiration simply because she was extremely persevering in whatever she wanted so if she made up her mind that she wanted something then it didn't matter what time of the day it was what day of the week it was she could just put her mind to it and just be at it for four weeks months years it didn't matter until she got what she wanted you know so i've got a little bit of that so i i would i would say that i've been fortunate 
uh, that I, I I had a very very uh, you know sort of uh, you know uh, high energy persevering mother uh, as as a role model growing up there. Yeah. Thank you, Rizwan. Priyanka wants to know how do you get through tough times in both personal and professional lives. Uh, I, I, what I what I normally do is I just r write up the problem uh, in my own way, you know, and I write uh, what the options are. I find it a far more mentally and emotionally comforting to put it down on paper than just keep on thinking about it in my head. Yeah. And the moment I do that, it just also allows me to be much uh, clearer in in articulating my concerns. Uh, clearer in identifying options, uh, so it's it's just uh, it's just a habit that I formed, which has served me well. My last question to you, Rizwan, is what has been your leadership mantra? So uh, that's a tough one to answer uh, short uh, in uh, quickly, but my leadership mantra is very simple. At one level, if I were to oversimplify it, that what you believe is important should be correlated with how you spend your time. So for example, right, if I believe that my kids are important to me, but I still can't find time to spend with my kids, then there is a problem. If I believe that getting my next job is important to me, but in, if I look at my calendar and if I'm not spending time on preparing to get my next job, then there is a problem. So my leadership style is very simple. You know, I tell people, you make a list of what are the top two or three things which are most important to you to achieve. And then look at your calendar and see if you're spending adequate amount of time on those items. Because many times you find, and it, it, we all do, right? So it's not like, you know, I don't have the, uh, the same problem that you may think this thing is very, or you may believe that something is very important. But then if you truly ask yourself in the last month, what did I do about it? How much time I spent on that problem or was on that opportunity or whatever it may be, actually, we didn't spend enough time on it. So what is true is that, you know, we may be, we may be at different ends, you know, I may be somebody who's without a job trying to find a job and I could be, uh, you know, uh, India's biggest industrialist. It doesn't matter who you are, right? We all have only 24 hours in a day, right? So that is the leveling uh, asset you may, all of us may have different amount of money in our pocket. We may be living in different homes. We may have different backgrounds, but we all have 24 hours in a day. And if that we could very simply, I think very, very effective because if you, yeah. uh, if you focus on what you want, then you, then, and if, uh, sorry, if you're not focusing on what you want, then you're just wasting your so time. You have to ask yourself a simple question. What is truly important for you? It could be personal. It could be professional, whatever it may be. And then you have to look at your calendar, right? And saying, okay, did I do justice in the last week, last month on spending the time which is proportionate to how important I think an issue is? And it could even be personal, right? As I gave you the example of, uh, you know, spending time with kids. So if there is a disconnect between what you think is truly important and how you're spending time, then you need to fix it. And if I you fix it, you. automatically many things will fall into place. I'm going to have a look at my calendar today, Rizwan. Yeah. And I'm going to see if it matches what I want to do in life or not. Yeah. So uh, on that note, thank you so much for taking time out. And uh, I'm sure uh, you putting such huge uh, you know, topics or, 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 or uh, heavy loaded topics like you know, leadership or you know, how do you uh, do innovation in a very simplistic manner had demystified a lot of things for us and, and made that thinking and and learning much more easier on all these topics and i'm sure the women out there must have enjoyed it as much as i have and on that note thank you so much rizwan for joining and uh, looking forward to meeting you all again in the next week talk thank you so much okay thank you very much yeah just getting a pleasure talking to you today yeah take care thank Bye. You.